Our text tonight is from the second book of Samuel in chapter 13. And when King David heard all of these things, he was very angry. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. But Absalom spake unto his brother neither good nor bad. In the town where I grew up, everybody knew the Mott children. The Mott family was one of the first and the largest shareholders in a little corporation called General Motors, an investment that made them wealthy beyond your wildest imagination. If and when the Mott kids ever showed up in public at a ballpark, swimming pool. They arrived in limousines, escorted by guys in suits, the meanest looking bodyguards anybody ever laid eyes on. And we always wondered what life might be like out there on the Mott Estates, beyond those high iron gates and acres of manicured lawn in houses that resembled castles, surrounded by servants' quarters and riding stables and garages full of Cadillac Eldorados. We would have been shocked as children to find out that sin in high places is no different from sin in low places. It's the same old story of physical and sexual abuse, parental neglect and abandonment, psychological scars from family friction and fighting and hatred and vengeance, all of which you find in this story. The times have changed. The palace, the royal residence of David in Jerusalem seems a million miles away from any neighborhood on the north side. But don't kid yourself. The human nature hasn't changed at all. While David was having his little fling with Bathsheba, another affair was taking place behind the scenes and in the shadows. A sordid little story that would have far-reaching effects, unleashing a storm that would knock the nation right off its foundation and provoke the last final crisis in David's life. Uh, David had many wives and he had children for most of them, which was not unusual for an eastern potentate in, in those days or in modern days, well, you see glimpses of it at the Mayo Clinic over in Rochester. When the Arab sheiks show up with numbers of their harem, Amnon was David's firstborn son. Amnon was David's favorite. Amnon was the heir to David's throne. And privileged as he was, it's not surprising that Amnon thought the whole world was his plum for the picking. But the one thing that he wanted most of all was the one thing he could not have. His beautiful half-sister, Tamar. He pined away for her to the point that he became haggard and lovesick. His friend and palace crony, Jonadab, fanned the flames. You are the king's son. Why ever should you be unhappy? Jonadab came up with a cunning plan, which he was sure would work, and it did work. Amnon took to bed, pretending to be sick. 
And David, the doting father, showed up. Is there anything that I can do for you? Anything that would make you feel better? Well, yes. He sighed. He was quite sure that he could get well if he could just have some homemade bread. The old family recipe. Made in the presence and by the hand of his sister Tamar. So Tamar was sent on a mission of mercy to the quarters of the crown prince. Unusual. Because the laws of the royal harem strictly forbid that kind of thing. But she dumped out the flour and kneaded the dough and made the loaves and baked the bread. And when she took it out of the oven and brought it into the bedchamber of Amnon, she didn't notice. But the staff of servants had mysteriously disappeared. Amnon seized her and overpowered her. She resisted. She protested. Do not do this, my brother. Don't you do this wicked thing. What about me? How will I ever live with this disgrace? What about you? You will become the fool in all of Israel. Speak to your father, the king. He's never held anything back from you. But he didn't listen, and he raped her. And then, an odd quirk of human perversity, he hated her intensely. And the text tells us he hated her more than he had loved her. Get out, he told her. No, my brother. Sending me away will be a greater wrong than anything you've done to me yet. He summoned the staff. Get her out of here. Bolt the door behind her. And they did. And so Tamar, who set out so fairly that day, is now driven back so foully into the streets. Her princess garments red, black ashes on her face, her hand on her head as though staggering beneath an unbearable burden and weeping all the way. She turned in at the door of her brother Absalom. Absalom guessed at once. Has your brother Amnon been with you? Hush now, my sister. Don't make more of than it is. Life goes on, I'll take care of it. Don't you worry. And Tamar remained then under the protective arm of her brother Absalom, but as a disgraced and, in Bible language, a desolate woman. And as you read this story, you're thinking, uh, one lurid detail after the other. What's this doing in the Bible? We don't want to hear about stuff like this. Jonadab and Amnon, I get enough of that in the daily newspapers and on television. I want a gospel story. This book needs a good editor and cut out all these sleazy parts. If God is working, why don't things turn out better? Why don't people behave better? Why do Jonadab and Amnon hog all of the space? If God is in control, why is this world such a mess? Well, the answer is obvious. It's the same world in which God works out his salvation. It's among the same people. Same world you wake up in every single morning. Shabby morality. Political corruption. Personal abuse. 
me first mentality. People say, that's why they don't read the Bible. I can't stand the Bible. It's so filled with violence. That's exactly why Christians do read the Bible. Not long ago, Paul Harvey told about a new venture in journalism out in Sacramento, California. A newspaper was published and they entitled it The Good News Paper. It told only good news. It folded in 36 months because people know that the good news isn't the whole story. And then it can never be the real story. It's like religious publications from every denomination, self-serving, self-congratulating. That's advertising. That's not real life with all of its defeats and failures. The Bible describes life not the way it ought to develop, but the way it does develop. And this world, sorry, not the way you want it to be, but the way the world actually is. The Bible reminds us, and boy, do we need it. We're not the only actors on this stage front and center. There's a whole cast of characters out there kicking up the dirt, stirring the plot. Parents and siblings and aunts and uncles and cousins and friends and strangers and enemies. All of them always working. Sometimes for our good and sometimes not. David didn't foresee any of this. How could he? On that bright day long ago when Samuel showed up in Bethlehem to anoint him king, the eighth and youngest son of a sheep herder. How could he have known all the heartache and the hardship and bloodshed, and intrigue, and grief that would follow. How can anybody? And yet God never let go of the life of the one he loves. God knows how to cross up the wicked and override the evil. And that's why we read the David stories. So that we do not lose heart and do not lose our nerve. When David heard about all of this, he was very angry. That's all. He was angry. No punishment. No retaliation. No reparation whatsoever. Father's upset. Dad's furious. But don't worry, he'll get over it. And he did. But Absalom didn't get over it. The ruthless crime of his brother against Tamar, the doting indulgence of daddy for his favorite. Absalom was reminded of it every single day for two years by the presence in his home of his ruined sister, the time. Time, yeah, lots of time. Time to allay suspicions. Time 
to make sure of the victim, time to make the punishment fit the crime, and time to bring Amnon down like his sister when he least suspects it. And in the midst of his pleasure, it's sheep shearing time out on Absalom's ranch. It's like the old roundup days in the American West. Eating and drinking and dancing and music and David is invited. Absalom invites the whole court at Jerusalem. Of course they can't shut down the government just to go to a hold down. Absalom knows it. Well then, Father, why don't you let the crown prince come as your representative? Let all of your sons and daughters come. You can guess the ending to this story. At the height of the festivities, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, the lights go out over in his corner. And when the torches are relit, my God, there lies the crown prince, weltering in a pool of his own blood. Pandemonium ensued. Frightened guests, terrified, ran out into the dark. Wild rumors reached the capital. All the king's sons are slain. Shock, horror all around. But one man knew. Jonadab says, oh, king, that's not true. Not all your sons are dead. Only one, Amnon, is dead. Jonadab was right. <laughs> Jonadab should know. By then, Absalom is gone. Over the fords of Jordan. North and east. To the home of his maternal grandfather. The Arab king of Geshur. David wants to go after him. Though it might mean war, and it will mean war. And he's restrained, boy. Barely restrained. And Absalom remains in exile for three years. But you will hear from him again. Now fast forward this sordid story to the trial of Jesus Christ. And you got it all one more time. Everybody's playing his own game. The religious leaders are protecting their lofty position. Pontius Pilate's protecting his job. Judas sells out a friend for a few extra bucks. Peter sells him out to save his own skin. And one indignity after another is heaped upon the innocent Christ, smiting bruising, spitting, scourging, piercing, nailing. Do you think you can't stand another word of it? And out of all of that, God brings a marvelous salvation. Only God could do it. And he did do it. And he still does it. That's what Jesus means. In this world, in this world, you shall have much tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome this world. Amen.